Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and, wel- and you're listening to Middle Path Radio, and welcome to Straight Talk, the show that discusses controversial issues, current affairs, and news uh, affecting the Ummah. So stay tuned and participate with us, inshallah. Uh, you can join us uh, or, uh, uh, and share your views. Call or text us on 074-77-080-248 or you can tweet us at Middle Path Radio. Tonight we want to discuss, alhamdulillah, the release of our brother Shakar Amar who was held in Guantanamo Bay since 2002 and released last week after 14 years without any charge. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is a great news for our community and especially his family. Inshallah, we want to we want to look at the issue around Guantanamo Bay, uh, torture, interrogation, and the involvement of the British intelligence agents, and also look at the effect it has had in the Muslim community. Uh, to discuss uh, this sensitive subject, we have with us uh, Brother Mamun Rahman, who is a khatib in Canary Wharf and brother Khairul Islam, who is an IT consultant. Inshallah, I want to uh, maybe start with the brothers. Uh, maybe first question that you know, comes to my mind is, why do you think it took them so long to release brother Shakar Amar, considering they have not found any evidence against him? Assalamu alaikum, uh, um, brother Kamal. Thank you for having me on your show. Um, Alhamdulillah, you're welcome. Uh, inshallah, I'll start. Uh, give my salams to all your listeners as well. Um, and inshallah, Rabbi Shahli, Sadri, Wa Yasirli, Amri, Rahlu, Lukdatan, Milisani, Wa Yafqahu, Qawli. That's interesting because you know, uh, he was cleared to be released in 2007, and it took them roughly about eight years eight before years, correct, he, yeah. he was released. Yeah. Um, and you can actually uh, probably see, uh, I, w- I would say, if you look at some of the comments that those who have been released, if you look at their comments, you can actually get really, really good picture in terms of why he may, it may have taken so long mm-hmm. for him to be released. So you had uh, Benjamin Muhammad, who was an Ethiopian, and he was released uh, a few years back. Uh, and he's described uh, uh, Shakar Amr as someone who is uh, who doesn't take you know he's, he's not just someone who just sits down and takes it yeah he's someone who's very very active very yeah, vocal very vocal mean. yeah yeah and uh, also in terms of language is very articulate he understands English he understands Arabic yeah so he knows exactly what's going on with all of the different um, uh, inmates mm-hmm. that they have mm-hmm. and that was I think what was the main problem they were worried that he's, he's gonna bring out exactly what is happening in Guantanamo Bay and they didn't want any of this stuff to come out especially what happened during 2005 and 2006 there was a who, hang- who was worried the government or the s- secret service British secret service or who were worried who was worried well, it's, it's both British secret service and also uh, Guantanamo Bay in terms of uh, the American secret service and the American government because he was going to embarrass them okay. heavily yeah um, and because Three people died during 2005-2006. Under, under inmates, torture? Or uh, these were people who were on, on hunger strike. Okay. Uh, but these were, while they were on hunger strike, they were being tortured and so on. Uh, and as a result of the torture, some of them were killed. And he knew uh, what has happened. And they thought he had stuff on actual documents and so on related to this. Mm. And they didn't want any of this stuff to come out. But do you think that he did have anything on them? Do you think... Was there any substantial that he could really... No, I think they were just worried. I'm not sure there was... Yeah, Yeah. I mean, this is what Benjamin or, you know, his uh, Clive uh, Stafford Smith, who was his lawyer, human rights lawyer Uh uh, from Reprieve, um, he also said, I mean, they... It looks like that, you know, uh, his his exact quotes were, I have known Shakur for some time because he's so eloquent and outspoken about the injustice of Guantanamo. He is very definitely viewed as a threat by the U.S. Not in the sense of being an extremist, but in the sense of being someone who can rather eloquently criticize the nightmare that happened there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so that clearly mm. says exactly what's happened, and so it, that's that's probably w- what uh, the feeling is that, that it took. 
Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that's why they 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 delayed it so long, isn't it? I mean, when was it? When did you say he was meant to be released? 2007. 2007. So, so eight <laughs> years, and then uh, uh, it was back and forth. They had, uh, ev- literally every single department had to authorize his release before okay. he could even be I mean, released. Just, just so maybe the next point would be <coughs> really, um, who are the main organizations and maybe campaigners that work tire- tirelessly for? Uh, uh, the release of uh, the brother. I think, uh, brother Mahmoud, you want to come in? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for thank you, brother, for coming uh, for letting me come into your show. Um, thank you very much for the actual question. You're welcome. Um, yes, the Rubik of Sh- uh, Shakar Amer. Uh, many organizations have actually worked tirelessly to actually um, work for his release. And to name some of the organizations, uh, to name some of the organizations who worked tirelessly for his release, were I have a list over here. For example, a uh, Save Shakar Ahmed campaign. There's also Amnesty International, Cage Prisoner, Close Guantanamo, Guantanamo Justice Center. Now, I must say that all of uh, these uh, organizations may have actually uh, worked tirelessly for the release of Shakar Ahmed. And even um, you have, uh, it was cited, David Cameron even actually requested. Jeremy Corbyn also requested for his release. J- I mean, Jeremy, so Jeremy Corbyn yeah. is a bit controversial. But yeah. I mean, he went to USA to actually ask for the release of Shah Karamat. But sometimes you may ask, you know, if, for example, British government or British MI5 and MI6 is complicit in his torture, why would Cameron actually, you know, um, ask for his release? Then it, do- it begs the question, you know, um, the tears in the crocodile's, you know, yeah, eyes, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Co- but crocodile tears. Co- crocodile mean. tears. But my question is, no matter how much, for example, these organizations actually campaign, but it, yet it took 14 years for American administration to actually release Shakar Ahmed, Ahmed. And it shows that in order to actually cut a metal, you need another metal. Mm. If you want to cut a diamond, definitely you need another diamond to cut. And for, your, uh, for the benefit of your listeners, what I would like to actually say that Muslims need to have a state to actually um, face up to the bullies of American administration and its allies in order to actually coerce them to actually stand for their Muslim sovereignty and Muslims' blood. I think Without I th- a state, for example, you will not be able to actually coerce these people. Bro- bro- Brother Mahmoud, I mean, I think, you know, y- you, can, you can come to that. I just wanted to basically maybe... For the sake of our listeners, can you yeah. maybe mention some? So, for example, like, you know, Green Party MP Caroline Lucas, you know, alongside yeah. campaigner for his release, said, Armour's case reinforces the urgent need for the judge-led inquiry into UK complicity in torture that the Prime Minister promised in 210, but then backtracked on. Even Wh- sh- Who was the quotation by? Uh, a Green Party MP Caroline Lucas. Okay. For them, I just want to give you another one. Shami Chakraborty, the director of campaign group Liberty, said, Armour's... Uh, Ahmed's his release brought huge relief to his family. Serious question remained. Why did it take so many years to persuade our closest ally to behave decently? How many young Britons have been radicalized as a result of this? Mm-hmm. At, at, at least in part by kidnap, internment and torture in freedom's name. Campaigners spoke of their concerns that he will be tagged or monitored by security services. Even Lord Carlyle the former independent reviewer of terrorism legislation told the press association the state cannot arbitrarily place restrictions upon him it would be quite wrong to demonize him because there is no evidence to justify demonizing him in 2015 just quickly yeah can uh, i come in yes yeah, sure, um, sure in relation to why it took um, so long to um, be released uh, one of the things that that shakar amar you know uh, his his lawyer had said was he was being beaten in his cell uh, against a wall, his, mm. uh, his head being smashed against the wall. Mm, mm. And all th- they were saying was, look, we want you to go back to Britain and spy for us. And he wouldn't say, he wouldn't agree to that. Mm, yeah? okay. um, so they said to him, look, you know, if you spy for us, then you can go. If you don't spy for us, then you're, you're going to die here. Okay. Yeah. So these were tactics that they were trying. Where, yeah. where, 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 you know, uh, how did you get to that? I mean, how, where, where did you get this evidence? Okay, because I'm, I'm a lot a of people would yeah. say, look, you know, this, this is all like a hearsay. No, no, actually, this okay. Is, this in is September, is in September, so 2000. Brother Mamouni yeah, can come yeah, in. Okay. I know you. 2011. Uh, Shakar Amr's lawyer, lawyer Brent McComb, 
yeah, who saw him in Guantanamo, alleged that uh, Amr was repeatedly, repeatedly beaten before their meeting. Yeah? Okay. He said that uh, Amr's mental, uh, physical health was deteriorating. It felt like... Uh, sorry, I, I have got... Uh, let me just find it. Well, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think... Fine. Sorry, so Mamu, uh, Brother Mamun, you wanted to come in. No, just I just wanted to actually say that cage uh, prisoners recently had, uh, held a seminar uh, in East London. And we know recently how the British government actually hunted down cage because they were actually representing, uh, representing one of the... Um, um, well, uh, they are representing many of the prisoners. Many of the prisoners. And I one of the, uh, some, someone, you know, for example, like uh, the, what's his name, the guy who actually beheaded in uh, Yemen, or I think, what's his name? Uh, 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 what's his name? Dave, uh, uh, something John. Yeah, jo yeah, yeah, something <laughs> John. <is it>? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, Cage also said that, you know, uh, this something John, you see what I'm saying? He was saying that the poli uh, police and the secret services were at his neck trying to make him a spy over the Muslims. And wherever he went, MI5 was behind him. So this is no surprise to me that when Brother Khairul is saying from his reports that, you know, uh, Brother Ch uh, Shaker has been actually told, given a condition no. that you will be only released if you spy on the Muslims. This is no new story. We've got a lot of yeah. stories like this. Yeah, so, so we've got it here. I've got it here in front of me. It was, um, Amr, there was a MI5 interrogator there. Yeah? Uh -huh. And the interrogator basically you know, gave him two choices. One choice was agree to spy on suspected jihadists in the United Kingdom or remain in U U.S. custody. Yeah? He said that the guard agent repeatedly knocked his head against the wall while an MI5 officer was in the room. Yeah? All I knew... He say, this is what he's saying. All I knew is that I felt someone grab my head and start beating my head into the back wall so hard that my head was bouncing. And they were shouting that they would kill me or I would die. Yeah, just uh, uh, it was uh, uh, Mwazi, yeah? I think that, that's I what think you said. I think it was Jihadi John. Jihadi John, Jihadi that's, that's correct, Mwazi, yeah. Mwazi, that's right. Yeah, yes. and, um, but if you look at um, uh, cage pri prisoners, yeah. you know, they were campaigning for Mozambique, who was, yeah. you know, alhamdulillah, was released. It's amazing. Cage, pri cage has got a lot of trouble for, you know, uh, uh, campaigning for, exposing, for this. It's exposing almost, this is it thing, almost yeah? exposing, that's isn't right, it? That's right, they've so. been called terrorists and everything, yeah? Okay, so just, um, I mean, you know, uh, just for, for the sake of our listeners, can you maybe mention some, obviously you did go on to mention uh, some of the background um, on, on Guantanamo Bay, the kind of torture that was inflicted on the prisoners. Yeah, I think we should talk about Guantanamo Bay because originally when it was um, you know, set up by uh, uh, the then Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, he he's, he's basically said he wanted to detain extraordinary dangerous people and even uh, you know he uh, coined a new phase uh, illegal combatants mm. rather than you know um, prisoners of war because prisoners of war have rights illegal, illegal combatants they don't have, don't no have rights. any rights so you can do wha what they like with them and we know the kind of tortures everyone knows in terms of in, in the media. We know about the waterboarding that went mm -hmm. ahead. The and there was a lot of controversy over that's right. waterboarding. That's right. Uh, um, if anyone doesn't know what waterboarding is, they can look uh, it when up. They, when they can look it up. I mean, uh, you, they put your head inside a sack, turn you upside down, and start, you know, uh, dropping water. Uh, jugs of water on your head makes so you feel like you're drowning. You can't, you, yeah, yeah, so the, right. the drowning yeah, effect. Breathe, drowning they, they drowning effect. Okay. On top of that, what we don't know is other tortures that used to go ahead in there. Uh, tortures like uh, sleep de uh, deprivation, yeah? um, extreme uh, cold, extreme heat, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, solitary confinement. Uh, in a very very so small this, space. This this is you, you you know this is sounds so much like a, a a torture camp really, isn't it? That's right. That's right. Torture camp. Um, we've had um, what's it called? Um, uh, Amnesty International going in there and uh, or the International Red Cross. And I've got a really really uh, interesting quote here from them. Uh, the quote. Uh, this is, this is uh, according to um, the New York Times. Uh, FBI agent was quoted. Um, let me find it. I mean, why uh, uh, Brother Khairul is yeah. at it? That when he said that solitary confinement. This uh, 
Shakar Ahmed was actually, you know, made to actually stay in a cell which is six foot by eight foot. Mm-hmm. And we've seen how all the violent pictures, you know, the ugly pictures that came out of Guantanamo Bay with people with green suits, how people were chained and locked. For example, they've been actually stopped to actually, you know, urine, go to the toilets, you know, are made to actually, you know, retain their, you know, pressure of their um, going to the loo. I mean, this is, you know, you know, the definite short torture. For example, like, you know, they've been beaten with vicious dogs. You know, they were actually, you know, hounded upon. Dogs, and for yeah. example, and not only that, you know, there was a lot of ex- sexual attacks on them as well. We've seen how the naked picture of all these, you know, Guantanamo pictures that came out. You, and you're the, talking all about, the world I, I have think, seen. I think you're talking about Abu Ghraib. Abu you know, Ghraib. Where they've actually sexually abused, sexually abused uh, the prisoners. Right, yeah. Men and, and women. Unfortunately, w- we don't hear a lot of that. I think that wherever you know these prisoners go, whether it's in Bagram or whether it's in Guantanamo Bay, whether it's uh, United Nations soldiers in you know Sierra Leone, sexual explo- exploitation goes everywhere. Is mm. what I'm saying. In o- especially in these camps. So we uh, had um, this FBI agent reporting when he went in one of the cells in a uh, in one of the cells. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he said he entered the interview room to find a detainee chained hand and foot in a fetal position on the floor with no chair, food or water. Most of the times they had urinated or defecated on themselves and have been left there for 18 to 24 hours or more. Yeah, and this is the kind yes. of torture we're talking about. Mm. Yeah? Um, assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for again joining us. You're listening to uh, Middle Path Radio Straight Talk. Um, you can join in and share your views. Uh, call or text us on 074-770-248 or you can uh, uh, tweet us at Middle Path Radio. You know, tonight we're, we're discussing the release of our brother Shakar Amor who was held in Guantanamo Bay since 2007. Um, you know, alhamdulillah, he was released um, after 14 years uh, without any charge. And this is the discussion that we're having. We've got uh, brother, uh, we got, uh, <coughs> sorry, brother Mamun Rahman uh, and brother Khairul Islam uh, here to discuss uh, these uh, issues, uh, their topic, inshallah. Um, what I want to do is basically, you know, um, you've talked about obviously the kind of torture inflicted on the prisoners. Um, what I want to do is basically maybe maybe look at um, what role did British secret agents or secret service play in his torture? Because that's something that's yeah. quite controversial. Just, just one more point before yeah, sure. that. Um, we, we're talking about Guantanamo Bay, yeah, and uh, the, it was at the time uh, the Bush administration, they said most of these people that were captured, these were from Afghanistan, these were fighting in Afghanistan war. Actually, they weren't because there's a report out uh, and it was by a Center for Policy Research. Uh, mm-hmm. They did a research on, on the um, you know, detainees in 2005. There was 517 detainees and of those detainees, over 80% of these detainees were people who were uh, provided to them by bounty hunters in Pakistan and Afghanistan region. And if you look at the bounty hunters, uh, up y- the U.S. was offering $5,000 for any one. $5,000 yeah, to, to uh, provide them with any foreign fighter or foreign, foreign people there. So it was so out... It, it was just, I could make, just take anyone right, in from the money. street and, and just say, look, okay, I'm going right. to get my $5,000. That's, right. that's right. So you have a really, really, really good example of you had um, Adil Nori. Yeah? Adil Nori had, uh, is, is just a dissident yeah, from Chinese Yuga province yeah, mm-hmm. who was in Pakistan and they obviously found him and he thought, oh, let's supply it. They can make $5,000. Supply wow. him to nothing to do with Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So these are, these are the things that happened. So eight, more than eighty percent of the inmates were people like that, just um, you know, picked up from Pakistan and and the border regions. And I you can see why you know these people are innocent people that were taken in and yeah. being tortured and went through this. Can I? Um, I've got a text, and I'll, I'll just read it out, and maybe you know, one of your brothers can maybe you know take that on. Um, it says, "Assalamu alaikum." Uh, It's so disheartening to hear the torture in Guantanamo Bay. How can we trust the UK government as they were complicit in Brother Shaka's torture? 
I think. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh, <laughs> I I, we, we talked about the British yeah. uh, British uh, secret yeah. uh, a, uh, service. I think the. Uh, I think with regards to the British secret uh, agency MI5 and MI6, I think their own people, British people, actually don't trust them. Um, throughout the uh, throughout the in the past years, we saw how British secret agencies actually not only actually tapped in their own citizens, you know, email co- email letters and you know telephone calls. Now the British government is actually you know uh, launching a charter, which is called the Snoopers Charter through the Parliament, in order to actually monitor everyone's you know online communication. And what they're going to actually do? They're going to actually is that recent? Yeah. yeah, this is recent. This is happening now as we speak. Okay. So in this time, for example, what they're going to do? They're going to call all the ISP providers and get all their databases to link to actually a giant database, and they're going to create to actually monitor and store everyone's communications. And this is the type of government that we are talking about. And they actually do this in the name of freedom, uh, in the name of protecting freedom, in the name of national interest. I mean, MI5 and MI6, I mean, for example, like, uh, Shakar actually said that when he was in actually Bagram, when he, when he was in, in Afghanistan, he actually went there as a charity aid worker. Remember, Shakar Amer was a British, uh, uh, was a uh, U.S. Army translator. So he actually worked for them before. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So he okay. was one of their, uh, you know, uh, sort of like uh, an employee. Uh-huh. You see what I'm saying? Okay. But then he says, for them, in a statement to his lawyers, Ahmed said shortly after being flown to Bagram on Christmas Eve in 2001, he said he was dragged into a room crammed with 10 people. Among them, there were British intelligence officers who began shouting at him in English, French, and Arabic. I felt someone grab my head and start beating my head into the back wall. He said, so hard that my head was bouncing. I later learned that this was a special technique they used called walling. But at the time, I had no understanding what they were doing. It was just a terrifying, they were shouting at me. I mean, in a leaked um, British um, email, uh, Brit- uh, email from the parliament, um, apparently Jack Straw said, after we interviewed um, sh- uh, prisoners or you know the uh, people they found captured, in, captured, captured you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They should be straight away flown to you know on Guantanamo Bay. So it shows that how British government, Jack Straw was the foreign minister, foreign of uh, minister at the time. How they were actually complicit in these uh, in these you know torture. Not only that, for example, we have in uh, there's a lot of reports of rendition by the uh, British and the Americans as well. So for example. A British resident called Bishar Al Rawi and Jamil El Banna were seized by the CIA, CIA in Gambia in November 2002. Okay. Uh, and CIA flew them to Guantanamo. Well, uh, no, no, in uh, Afghanistan. It was Gam- Gambia yeah. is in where is yeah. that? So That's Gambia in is in you know uh, is in uh, Af- Africa. Africa, yeah, yeah. So this is in also in 2002. Mm-hmm. So rendition, complicity to torture by MI5 by MI6 is an old story. There's nothing new in that. And everybody knows, those people who actually follow news, those people who are up to date with current affairs, know the history of British well, intelligence officers, you know, complicit to you but know, bro- torture bro- and Brother bro- Mamoun, I mean, uh, the point is that isn't Brother Shakir privileged that he's a British citizen? You know, what about those detainees from other countries? Actually, who who I, will campaign um, or, or represent them. I mean, I mean, you know, the thing is, we know, had Amnesty and all of those yeah, organizations. I mean, the thing campaigning. is, yeah, when Shakar Amer was actually captured by the bounty hunters in Afghanistan, and when he was actually handed over to the Americans, initially he thought he was relieved. Mm, he thought, mm. hold on a second, here I am actually captured by bounty hunters for trivial amount of money, you know, five thousand dollars. Is what I'm saying, and handed over to the Americans. Americans, by the way, um, so they are the you know bastions of the free world, bastion of the you know human rights. Is what I'm saying. These people actually go to Muslim worlds, and we all heard about Tiananmen Square, how the Western government said that you know human rights, human rights, yeah. sang human rights. Yeah. So he yeah. thought you know here, I am actually passed on to people who actually hold the beacon of human rights. Surely I'm going to be saved. Yeah. But he was wrong. He was wrong because these are the very people who actually kept him for 14 years and kept him away from his family. You know, the day he was actually captured, he had a baby uh, son whose name is, I think, Faris. He was born. Mm. He never saw so these people. So after 14 years, yeah, he was he reunited with his family. Yeah. So, for example, every time, you know, 
even when he actually tried to actually land in, you know, Britain, the air touchdown on Britain's airport in, uh, just in 30th of October, he actually said to his family not to come to the airport. He was scared. He said, I will just meet my lawyers. So this is how much psychologically these people have to actually undergo. Mm. And um, talking about, you I know... I think the point, the point you've made, look, yeah. you know, um, you've illustrated definitely like how he was captured yeah. and how he was sent to Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. But, you know, perhaps maybe you want to look at the the uh, uh, the uh, the prisoners who are taken from other countries or maybe from Afghanistan who don't have a uh, who don't have amnesty who don't have you know uh, maybe uh, yeah, yeah. uh, cage uh, yeah, prisoners yeah. and these kind of organizations. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I think it is really a sort of like a sorry state for the Muslims who actually are not backed up by human rights like you know cam amnesty or or um, Ca uh, cage, cage prisoners, prisoners yeah. and things like that. Who are they going to be actually? Uh, who will actually represent them. And here we must actually really think, for the benefit of your listeners, I what I would say is the Muslim rulers, you know, should be actually, you know, campaigning for those people. You know, we know these stories like, you know, when someone gets caught in Saudi Arabia because of alcohol offenses or drug-related traffic offenses, we find British government very quickly, these people are convicted and, you know, they have evidence, full evidence that these people have been caught because of drug trafficking, yet because of the pressure of Western nations against their um, uh, slave nations like Saudi Arabia. I mean, in a nation, I wouldn't say nation, but the government. These governments buckle down. And by, by their buckling down, they actually release those prisoners. I well, mean, you know, bro prisoners. Brother but Mamun, when it comes I'm to Muslims, they don't. Yeah. Brother Mamun, I mean, let they me, don't I actually, think, I, I, you know, you know this, this would be a good, uh, good text for, for because you, you actually just hit the yeah. nail on the he That's head. Right. Let me just quickly read out uh, to our listeners. We've got a text, um, and it says, and this is what it says. It says, it, to, uh, it seems there is no difference between UK, USA, and some of these tyrannical regimes. Yeah we complain about in the Muslim world, like Mubarak, e uh, Egypt, or Saddam in Iraq. So I think what he's trying to say is basically, look, you know, there's no difference between those uh, tyrannical, uh, uh, those uh, rulers like uh, uh, Sisi who has uh, come to the UK and yeah. he was very um, warmly welcomed, yeah? yeah? It's amazing, yeah? If you, you, uh, you, have to, you have to discuss Sisi now on this issue because if, Sisi has come over, yeah? And this is a guy who, you know, from their own principles, democratically elected president, yeah, M democratically elected president, and he just, you know, threw him out, yeah, a dictator in position of uh, presidency, and he's welcomed in, uh, in, in Downing Street, 10 Downing Street. That says a lot. That says a lot. Uh, when it comes to Muslims or when it comes to Islam, really, uh, you know, uh, you can see what's going on. Uh, but what, what would, in, in a way, if you like, you, uh, Europe is like you know we, we fortress Europe, yeah. Mm. And so mm. they're first class. Everyone, everyone else can anything can ha happen to. I, I, else, I think so I, I think. just want to quickly it's related. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read out this text. Where you know, Alhamdulillah, we're getting a lot of text, um, and I would pick the ones that's relevant, inshallah. Um, it says we tend to blame the Western governments, but should we not look at uh, look at uh, more look at more into our own rulers who hand over the brothers. Uh, and sisters like uh, Afia Siddiqui, um, uh, 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 Shakar Ahmad, etc., for bounties and to appease the Western rulers. Um, uh, that's the yeah, text that I we've I just mean, received. I mean, can I come back on this? One? Yeah. You see, yeah. I don't want to actually blow the trumpet of um, the Islamic State, if you like, the so called Islamic State of Afghanistan. But we saw, for example, like when uh, Osama bin Laden was actually asked by the Americans to hand him over. We found that you know Afghanistan said that look he is a guest of our nation, he's come over here and with no cost that we will ever actually hand over Osama bin Laden. Here we saw some semblance of Islam in Afghanistan, and we saw how they reacted. Now he said that he needs. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, you can correct me, but yeah. wasn't that the case that he said look you know he needs to go through a trial, fair trial before yeah, we and can they said we can we can hand him yeah, over. They yeah. said that look if you want to have the trial, have the trial in Pakistan. We oh, will Afghanistan, you mean, sorry. Afghanistan and Pakistan, they said. You know, we okay. will have the trial in uh, you know, Pakistan or Afghanistan. Come down over here with your lawyers. We will find out. If Osama bin Laden, then we'll hand him over. But we will not actually extradite him just because you say so. Because the Muslim blood 
is very, very honorable. And, you know, because we know, all know the, um, the narration of Umar radiallahu anhu, where he said to the Kaaba when he was doing the tawaf, he said the blood of the Muslim is so honorable, it's more honorable than the walls of Kaaba. And he was saying that to the Kaaba, oh Kaaba, you're so precious, you're so honorable, but you know what? The blood of a Muslim is more honorable to you. And this is the value that Muslims should hold. Can I, can and I Muslims have actually campaigned for it. But the thing yeah. is, as I said to you before, that you need a metal to actually cut a metal and a state to actually buckle a state. You know what I'm saying? I'm and you very, can't have very, that. Very good saying? examples. But I think what I want to maybe come out, because that uh, come on to is basically that text, um, it talked about Afia Siddiqui. Yeah. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of... Um, uh, uh, you know, media attention. A lot of uh, uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, 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 organizations that are campaigning for her. I mean, what's the backdrop? I mean, obviously, I don't want to go into that, but you can see. I think what, you, what is it? You can see there's clear. I mean, it seems like there's clear double standards with all of these um, issues that you you talk about. There's, there's one. I mean, Guantanamo Bay is all Muslims. Yeah. Mm. Do you have another base where you have all the you know the racists? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's you had uh, Anas, point, uh, actually, yeah. Anas, uh, mm. Breiviks, yeah, mm. and you had uh, uh, who killed seventy-seven people in yeah, Denmark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On a racist attack. I mean, this person is just killed, called a they mass murderer. They should have a prison for those. He's not even a terrorist. He's a mass murderer. That's what he is. Nine people killed in America just this year, earlier this year, uh, by um, what's the what's the person's name? I forget. It's um, John this something, okay. uh, and. You know, he's he's seen as someone who's uh, who's a mass murderer, mm. yeah, and these are people killed in the name of so race. Do, so, and do so you on. think? Do you so think? The, the, sorry, do you think the West champions as leaders of justice? Um, human rights and rule of law is there a double standard? I mean, obviously, from what that's I can, I think that's what we can see. Double can standard when it comes yeah, to Muslims. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. also, you know, if you just look at Britain, just here, look at the the uh, like Mahmoud was pointing out, you know, the anti-terror laws that's been brought in or, you know, the prevent strategy. Yeah, they, they are they're unfairly targeting the Muslims. If you look at, you know, these uh, Ofsted reports uh, into Birmingham uh, school, uh, these, be, these are outstanding schools and suddenly, you know, the rules get changed when mm. it comes to Muslims. Yeah? Mm. Uh, and uh, new laws uh, bring in, new uh, regulations in terms of how they judge schools to be good or outstanding. If you look at, you know, even uh, in Poppy, it's a Poppy week this week, and the yeah. pressure that the Muslims are under to have the poppy, yeah. If you don't have the poppy, then you're seen as you know people who maybe don't anti, uh, anti establishment, anti -state, yeah, anti -state. anti state, yeah. yeah. Or I if you look at the elections, yeah, the, the mosques they're never political, but as soon as the elections happen, they have to have something. Uh, you know, there's so much pressure. They have to pressure mobilize. from the government, or do we create our own pressure? No, I, mean, I think this is pressure coming from the state, yeah, uh, coming from the media, which is, you know, in a way, uh, towing the, um, the, the government, government lines, lines really, okay. yeah, to try and integrate the Muslims. Yeah? So it's not enough to be a good law-abiding citizen for a Muslim. Yeah, uh, these are these are things that you can't be. You yeah. have to, you know, change your beliefs. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I think through these kind of pressures uh, on the Muslim community and the double standard that Brother Khairul was talking about, I think it's important to actually say to our viewers that Muslims should not actually compromise when it comes to justice and speaking for justice. And I think they should stand firm and speak the truth. Because they are actually not alone in this. Even the British public you know, still have a lot of decency in them. I mean, I can quote to you a, a recent... Um, uh, recently, the president of Oxford's uh, Mansfield College, Helena Kennedy, she's a QC uh -huh. and a human rights lawyer, blamed Cameron's decision of inviting President Sisi. The public should know that the government of Britain have always held a policy and practices that are very inhumane. Sisi has corrupted the legal system in Egypt. He has passed death penalty to over 1,000 people simply because they were part of the previous Morsi government. So people like this are actually, like um, uh, Chakraborty and things like that, people are voicing concerns against these double standards of uh, Western uh, governments and the collusion with corrupt Muslim leaders, uh, leaders in the world. So the, but the public, you know, are also sometimes brainwashed by the media. But there are other people out there who still have conscience. And my address to the Muslims and the people of Britain should be that they should 
actually um, uplift or you know maintain their you know right consciousness and never be compromised when it comes to justice and striving for justice. Okay, you're listening to Middle Path Radio, and uh, uh, this is Straight Talk. Um, inshallah, we are discussing the release of our brother Shakar Amar. Uh, who was held in Guantanamo Bay. And the really, you know, we want to try and examine, maybe look at how the community, Muslim community, how has that affected the Muslim community? And to do that, we have, we have brother uh, Mamoun Rahman and uh, Khairul Islam. Inshallah, so um, my next question would be is, um, how should Muslims react to the ongoing torture, the humiliation, and the growing Islamophobia? Mm. I think that's a very, very important discussion, yeah, because uh, like we were saying, uh, I think Mamunbai was saying, and I can, you know, can totally agree with that. It's very, very difficult in this, uh, in this climate to even carry basic beliefs of Islam, like Sharia, like Khilafah, like, you know, believe in Islamic rules, the, or, or even, you know, campaign for Palestine. Or, I mean, it's, it's just interesting. Uh, Assad has killed more than 250,000 people. And how, you know, it's seen as someone they can do, you know, you can do business with. It doesn't make sense. Or even uh, Israel, uh, who has killed over 2,000 people. Yeah? You know, there's one standard for Muslims, one standard for everyone else. It just doesn't make sense. So the Muslims, you know, what we need to do is we need to realize what our situation is and have practical, you know, Islam doesn't leave any situation unturned. It Bro gives practical solutions. Let me just go through some of the okay, practical now solutions. I've just got a text, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you, uh, you know, go through that and okay. then I'll, I'll read out the text. Okay, so le let's look at some of the practical. I mean, firstly, um, there's a few things. I mean, one thing is, you know, we are living in uh, this non-Muslim country, Muslim, so we've got certain things that uh, we can do here, which is, you know, we... Uh, we need to do the, do the dawah w to the non-Muslims. We need to educate. We need to talk to people about Islam. Yeah. Okay. So and we need to counter this anti-Islam narrative that's in the media. Yeah. So the people are aware of what their governments get up to in, in the name in, in their name. And also, if we give them the Islam, the true Islam, yeah, they can see. You know, it's not like how when the you, government when you are mean saying. By, sorry, when you mean by true Islam, do you mean the arguments for these? Uh, uh, you know, when, when it comes to the media, obviously, no, no, no. Uh, we can see the vilification. Of One thing some is of the all of those ideas. As as Muslim, wherever you are, you have to do dawah to Islam. Yeah, so okay. they can see Islam as it is, yeah, and they can see what the media is portraying. So I think that's very important, as well as countering. Don't you think our mosques are doing that? I think the mosques have been quite closed. Um, I mean, all, all uh, no, these things are off limits. They don't. I mean, they're afraid to discuss Khilafah, afraid to discuss Sharia, afraid to discuss the solutions that Islam gives for everyday problems that the pe people are facing. For example, the economic problems that people are facing. Yeah, the uh, you know they have the boom and bust that's happening. Islam has practical solutions to these kind of problems. Before before I come to uh, uh, Brother Mamun, can I quickly read uh, one of the texts? I mean, there's a lot of texts coming in, but I. I'll read this one. I think it's relevant to what we were discussing here. It says, a study conducted into terrorist attack in Europe over the last five years reveals that only 0.5% were, uh, were done by Muslims, while the others were committed by non-Muslims, mainly separatist political groups. Yet, you think by following the media and the politicians that terrorist is somehow a part of Islam, that doesn't even count for Western state terrorism. I mean, uh, just to you know, quickly you know, come on to this. Uh, this is a very good, uh, I, mean, I mean, this statistic really, really shows you know, what is really obvious. Because if you look at you know, Guantanamo Bay, out of all these hundreds of you know, prisoners, of, uh, prisoners that actually they kept, you know, most of them, almost actually 95% of them are held without charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. only about only few of them maybe have, may have been convicted. You know what I'm saying? And it shows... Is that because they confessed under torture? Probably it, within the, they confessed under torture. But it shows to the rest of the world blatantly that, look, there is no proof that Muslims are behind uh, anything that they're saying. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes if there's one or two bad apples, and I would question why they're doing it in the first place. Are they doing it because out of reaction? But just coming back to the point about what should the Muslims do... 
I mean, I would actually say to our Muslim view, uh, listeners and also to the people that, look, fear the fire of Jahannam. Allah has actually placed as a reward for the Muslims and for the guru doers of good, Jannah and Jahannam. We must not at any one time, he's not saying, buckle to the pressure that the government is actually placing, whether it's psychological pressure or pressure of, uh, bec of uh, <coughs> torture or for imprisonment. And sometimes, even um, Brother Khairul has mentioned about mosques, you know, they're sometimes scared. Sometimes it's also a, an issue about education of the Muslims, understanding about Islam. For example, do you know what? My son comes to yesterday to me, mm. and this is a really a um, true uh, story here. Um, a life story, I would say. Everything we're discussing, obviously, is true. Um, he comes to and says to me, uh, Dad, you know you what? You mean personal story? Personal story. <laughs> okay. He goes to me, Dad, you know what? Um, my teacher, Api, she says to me, oh, David Cameron has said so-and-so in the Manchester you know, speech. Yeah, don't, don't mention any schools. Obviously, yeah, yeah. we don't want to. Yeah, no, I'm not yeah. going to say that. My, uh, my Api says that David Cameron has said so-and-so about you know, madrasas that we are teaching hate, you know, filling the minds of our kids with poison and our hearts with hate. But you know what? We're going to show David Cameron what we're actually really teaching the uh, madrasas. And she said, look, we're going to actually do a project. And this project is going to be about how we are all equal. You know what I'm saying? How, for example, like, and we're going to do a, a project about all the nation's flag and things like that and how we are all equal. And I said, no, hold on a second. You know, this is not right. Sometimes you need knowledge, you know what I'm saying, in order to respond to what these onslaught against Muslims are. You know what I'm saying? For example, Allah says in the Quran, surely the people who actually sit lazily, even to the believers, he says, those people who actually sit lazily at home and those who strive for the path of, you know, for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are not equal. He's saying amongst the Muslims. But then he goes in another ayah, I think in Surah Al-Imran or somewhere, um, don't quote me, I think uh, Surah 6, he says that, um, just because by the, the difference of night and day, the difference between water and uh, earth, uh -huh. so vast, do you think, you know, uh, they're not alike? Do you think that, for example, the, 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 the carriers of truth, believers, yeah. and the carriers of falsehood, are they alike? Surely they're not alike. And I, and I think, you know, Allah is not even discriminating anyone here. He's talking to people as human beings because he distinguishes even within the Muslims between the believers who stay at home, who strive you know, for the path of Allah. And even he's talking about the ummah, um, the whole humanity. He's saying that those who believe in the truthhood of uh, you know, the uh, creator and those who don't, are they equal? Ma Mumbai, and I'm gonna and coming to the madrasas, you see what I'm saying? And they're saying that, topic you know, a little bit, but I'm gonna find saying, are they equal? Obviously, yeah. we shouldn't respond like this, you see what I'm saying? We should respond with justice, with enlightenment, mm -hmm. with knowledge of Islam. Just we should going, not just respond within it. Uh, just brother, just taking back, to back to the topic yeah, yeah. in terms of uh, how should the Muslim respond. It's firstly, understand the problem. Yeah, and you don't. Anyone can see if you pick up any newspaper, if you read the internet, or if you watch any news channels, you can see the dire situations the Muslims are in. Yeah, one thing in Islam we have is a concept of one ummah. So yeah. the problems wherever Muslims are, we have. You know, we it's our problem. Yeah, okay. so we have a problem in Britain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of anti-terror laws and so on. But the Muslims wherever they are, they're suffering. Whether it's in Rohingya. Yeah, the Muslims are being killed. Whether it's in uh, African Republic, Central African Republic, in uh, the Middle East, if you look at the Palestine, yeah, well, kind of things Syria that are Pacific, happening. Yeah. In Syria, 250,000 people uh, have been killed so far. Or the refugee crisis, people are trying to enter. Most of them, most people are Muslims, they are trying to enter. So the Muslims are in a dire situation. And where we talked about locally, this is what we can do in terms of um, countering the uh, anti-Islam narrative that's in the media. We, sh we should do that. But we should realize the ultimate solution. The ultimate solution is, you know, we need to really have an imam. Yeah? Rasulullah said, the imam is from where behind whom we fight and from behind whom we protect ourselves. If we don't have that protection, then this, these things, there's nobody there to speak up. Who's going to speak up for the Muslims? I think I think you've just come on to my uh, uh, maybe maybe the final point that I want to discuss is that look you know um, the rule of prisoners yeah obviously the West has defined and it's got its definition and um, but 
the pre rule of presence of war from the Western and Is uh, Islamic definition is different. Yeah? And most impor importantly, how would Islamic law deal deals with prisoners of war? I think that's the issue that maybe we want to look at because, yeah, we can say this is wrong, but they do have some sort of justice system, you know, that, that they've got this, they allow uh, these organizations to maybe campaign. But under Islam, under Islamic law, and maybe that's what Mamun Bai can come in, obviously you've given a lot of Quranic um, evidences, but under Islamic law, how would we deal with prisoners? I mean, the thing is, you know, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, we find that I mean, the whole uh, Islamic, you know, jurisprudence is actually um, littered with, you know, uh, the Sharia rules related to, you know, prisoners of war. Um, we find, for example, in the Battle of Badr, when um, the, when the Muslims actually captured a lot of the prisoners of war, you know, what has happened is that they actually they didn't torture them. Torture is completely forbidden in Islam. So under no circumstances, under no you, circumstances you can actually torture them. In fact, Allah actually says in the Quran, when the Quraysh actually blamed, accused Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam of killing someone in the holy month, is I'm saying, just before the battle of Badr. Allah actually reveals a you know ayah in the Quran which says that oppression is much worse than killing. So torture. The torturing someone who is alive, you know, uh, beating them, uh, de uh, depriving them of their what, sleep. What they do in Guantanamo Bay. What they do in Guantanamo Bay or uh, Bagram is much, much worse. This is, this is the you know, revelation of Allah SWT in the Quran. But what the Muslims did, for example, so like you, they uh, would... Battle of Badr, yes. Sorry, yeah, Battle yes. of Badr or any other uh, situations. They actually, you know, they f fed their prisoners well. They clothed the prisoners well. They treated them with dignity. And if they were to be released, you know, the condition was you pay a ransom. If you pay a ransom, you can be released. Or, for example, like these prisoners of war, they were actually exchanged for other Muslim prisoners from the opposite side. You okay. know what I'm saying? Okay. Or in the case of, you know, uh, we found that, you know, some, you know um, some of the skills of the prisoners of war was actually used by the Muslims. So if they knew how to read or write, if they knew any technical skills, those were actually used. From to the prisoners them, really. to ransom them, you know what I'm so the motive was to actually, you know, free them. And not only that, the thing is, you know, a lot of the um, what do you call it? Non-Muslims even actually commented on this in uh, in the Crusades, during the Crusade and during the Salawiddin. And uh, for example, the rules concerning prisoners of war in Islam mentioning clearly. So men and women were generally prisoners of war, but in Free Islamic Arabia. Upon capture, those captives were not executed. They were made to beg for their subsistence. Uh, Islamic government to provide food and clothing on a reasonable basis to captives, regardless of their religion. If the prisoners were in the custody of a person, then the responsibility was. Is, is that a quotation yeah. you've just read? Um, yeah. Historically, Muslims routinely captured large number of prisoners. Yes, aside from those who converted, most were ransomed or enslaved. Non-Muslim commentator writes, for example, like Pasteur, he writes. It was a custom to enslave prisoners of war, and the Islamic State would have put itself at a grave disadvantage. But, but its enemies had it not reciprocated some, to some extent by guaranteeing them humane treatment and various possibilities of subsequently releasing themselves. It ensured that a good number of combatants in the opposing armies preferred captivity uh, rather than dying in the battlefield. And I just have a, you know, William Muir, who wrote, a, uh, a, who also wrote, in pursuance of Muhammad's commands, the citizens of Medina and such of the refugees as possessed houses received the prisoners and treated them with much consideration. Blessing be on the men of Medina, said one of these prisoners in later days. They made us ride while they themselves walked. They gave us wheat and bread to eat when there was little of it, contenting themselves with dates. William Moore, uh, The Life of Muhammad. So this is, this, is, this is like, you know, non-Muslim commentators were actually discussing how good the prisoners were. So, 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 so sorry, I'm just, just going to yeah. cut you in. Yeah. Um, so the objective of, of prisoners, yeah. prisoners of war, was to what from the Muslim? The objective of, of prisoners of war for the Muslims, you know, end of the day, they are human beings. And every human being, yes, they have committed a crime. They, are, they were in the battlefield against the Muslims. You know, they have surrendered, so they've been taken as a prisoners of war. But nevertheless, you need to treat them 
with some sort of dignity. You see what I'm saying? You don't torture them. You don't sexually assault them. You don't rape them. You don't make them naked. You don't electrocute them, you know, over their genitals. Like we saw some of the pictures in, you know, Bagram or uh, Abu Ghraib, Abu Ghraib and etc. This wasn't the case. This is the very inhumane actions by the so-called civilized world in 21st so century. Do, do, you think, do you think the West is shooting uh, 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 their own feet? Or the West, the thing is, the West has shot itself many yeah. times in its foot. But you need really a nation to rise up and actually propagate that, expose that, you know, uh, you know very, very clearly. And to actually use this as a mileage to actually win against the battle of ideas, against democracy and uh, so-called uh, the, the sham of democracy and the sham of secularism. Without the state, as I said, and the state apparatus of media, you know what I'm saying, the power of media, you know, these things will go unaccounted for. Yeah, sorry, I, I think we, 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 we've got maybe about uh, five minutes. Yeah, um, sorry, uh, yeah uh, Brother just, just like to, to um, point out, I mean, the Muslims, we believe the rules and the Sharia are from Allah Ta'ala. And you can see, here is the difference, here lies the difference. If I was making lo laws and if I was making rules, yeah, I would make rules that benefited me and I wouldn't care about the other men. So it, the other men can go to hell uh, mm. no matter what, you know. So that person can be tortured, can also whatever I can think of to hurt my enemy, I would do. So, yeah? so the rules, sorry, I mean, I'm just going to cut you in. The rules uh, from Islam is obviously divine. That's what you're saying. That's exactly and, what I'm saying. And uh, this the is Western not rules, obviously, they're continuously changing. You know, they're, they're uh, raising the bar. Obviously, you know, um, the new uh, uh, laws are coming in. It's all too... And like you said, it's because... It is the human mind that That's is right. actually... Uh, That's right. So we've got our sources, which is the Quran and Sunnah, Ijma uh, Sahabi, and so on. And that's what you can follow if you look at these uh, all these tortures and so on are not allowed so therefore you no matter how much you want to introduce that you couldn't do that whereas if you've got an evolving law if you've got um, rules that you can decide on you can choose anything you like and that would be fine because you're just making up laws as you go along and i think what we could we should do really is is back to us which is to to so be very, very active yeah, in, in with that, in this with, with the community, with the Muslims and with the non-Muslims, so that they, they feel that this, this is something that is good for the community, good for people, yeah? and, uh, and they can counter what the governments are I'm trying gonna, to I'm do. Gonna, I'm going to finish, can, 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 finish with the last no, no, text. Can, can I just come with no, one sorry. second? Okay, okay, okay. I really like to actually shame the, uh, the so-called uh, people who say they're actually doing everything uh, uh, in the light of human rights and in the defense of you know, national interests. And underneath, they're actually really sort of like doing all the oppressions you know, that we see under the sun. I'd just like to quote one thing. During, the, during uh, his rule, Caliph Umar made it illegal, illegal to separate related prisoners of war from each other. After a captive complained to him for being separated from her daughter. And imagine people like Shakar Ahmed, who has been actually separated from his family. Not only his family, his newborn child for 14 years. And this is the example of Umar radiallahu anhu. Someone complained to him about removing him from his family. And they were actually, you know, made to actually come together, the family of the prisoner and, and his uh, daughter. These principles were also honored during the Crusades, as exemplified by sultans such as Saladin al-Kamil. For example, after al-Kamil defeated the Franks during the Crusades, Oliverus Scholasticus praised the Islamic laws of war, commenting on how al-Kamil supplied the defeated Frankish army with food. So this is goes shame against those false bastion of human rights bearers and, um, and uh, people who call for equality and justice in the United Nations. Shame on them, and they should hear these kind of quotes, and this quote should actually empower the Muslims that their belief and their values are much, much strong, M and much <laughs> more, the moment, much I'm more have supreme, to stop you. <laughs> and they have nothing to hide when it comes to Islam and their beliefs. And they need to actually use these quotes, research their way of life, their culture, and come out in the streets and discussing these points with fellow citizens of this country, wherever they are, whether they are in USA, whether they are in Britain, because not everyone is actually brainwashed by these you know, media 
uh, you know, false media Bombay, campaign. I'm going to have to get uh, brother. Yeah, uh, my last Halloween. word, basically. Last yeah. Nothing, yeah. you know. What we I, I've got a couple uh, of texts, but yeah. I think I'm, uh, I'm going to just have to, because we're running out of time. We've got about two minutes left. So okay. um, if you can just uh, sum, uh, yeah. give us a summary. In sh- uh, in yeah, I think the uh, way is, is um, I think we shouldn't, all these dire things that we hear, we shouldn't become negative and, you know, uh, depressed about it. And what we should realize is this is a test from Allah Ta'ala. And we should take it as a test. And we should take it on ourselves to become even more active. Because that's exactly what Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala wants in this situation. That we become more active and we go out more and we explain our position more and more and more. And this is, uh, if we do that, then we're saved on Yamul Qiyamah. And that's all that matters. Mahmoud by one minute, yeah, please. <laughs> Um, first of all, as I said, that you know, um, that the, uh, all I wanted to actually say again, I want to actually echo Brother um, uh, Khairul over here, that the people of conscience of this world, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, if we actually stopped our responsibility for standing up for the truth, for speaking against falsehood, oppression, injustice, then we will be ever be actually pushed towards more into the darkness, more into, you know, um, whatever, uh, a- anarchy. And people should, wherever they are, they need to stand for truth and stand for justice. And this is the only way. They've got nothing to fear. They've got only to fear about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they have the hope of Jannah and they need to fear the uh, Jahannam. Jazakallah khair. It's been a very deep, uh, enlightened discussion. Uh, many thanks to our panels and especially to our listeners. I hope you can join us next week for another exciting evening uh, here at Straight Talk. Uh, If you couldn't join us uh, for this discussion, you can follow us on Twitter at Middle Path Radio and continue with this discussion. Thank you for listening. This is Middle Path Radio. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Middle Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station.